Oh, that does sound better. <laughs> As Beiru said, I've been selected to give this uh, lecture, which is in um, Mexico in a few weeks. So uh, I'm thinking I'd like to give a, a talk to introduce myself uh, to Monash. Um, and um, I need to practice this talk. So what you're going to get today is a practice for the CDC 2022 Bode Lecture. So I'd just like to make something clear. Um, over 40 years, I've done everything from theory of power systems to last week finishing a consulting report for the New South Wales government. It's impossible for me to talk about all that in one hour. So what I'm going to do today is really about my scientific background in power systems, okay? So it's a very particular point of view to be presented to 2,000 control engineers in Cancun in Mexico. So it's very particular. And I understand that you may come away from the talk, number one, thinking he didn't talk about this or that. And number two, the slides are still in a state of uh, development. Um, I've actually got them being put into LaTeX at this uh, at this time. Anyway, the theme of the talk, it, it's an overview talk, power system dynamics and control. <clears throat> and um, there are various themes that have been with me throughout my career. One of them is the structure of the grid, the actual network structure. The other is how we mix physical modeling and data together because power system models are inherently hybrid. We can't physically model everything. Some things like the, the aggregate load in the system is very much data-based. Um, and then there's the whole agenda of machine learning and adaptive control and so on, which helps give us uh, faster responses, um, makes use of big data, all that. You, you know that scientific story. So how will I proceed? I'll give a little bit of background and then the subject power and control. They go intimately together. Then a bit of a story about structured data and learning. And then hopefully I get to talk about the fact that almost everything I've done for 40 years is going obsolete. So we need you, the younger people in the room here to spend the next, they don't have 40 years. You've only got like a few years. <laughs> To, um, to redo all this facing the new era of variable renewable energy, batteries, you know, the whole grid is just being changed. So I, I think it's an exciting area to work on. And, um, and it's my aim in Cancun to get more young people interested in the subject. So let's just review very quickly. The power system transitions over the years, of course, we will go right back to um, the century before last uh, with the so-called current wars, where there was all kinds of concerns about the safety of whatever we chose as the electricity grid. Was it going to be safe? Could we you know, get the power over any kind of distance? And then early in the last century, there was a lot of science. We, we don't actually appreciate this. And I know it's not fashionable to say anything positive about Russia right now, but they actually produced a lot of a lot of their top scientists came into power grids in order to develop the country. Lenin famously said communism equals Soviets plus electricity. So and there are stories about some of these scientists being in and out of Stalin's jails. They'd go into jail for criticizing and they'd come out because they were needed to actually, you know, develop the grid. And so there are major heroes around the beginning of the last century who, who established the kind of the fundamentals that you get in a textbook these days <laughs> with basic analysis, the, the beginnings of transient stability theory, et cetera. But the major advance, I think, possibly the single most significant application of control in engineering, okay? You can question, the roboticists will probably question it. But the only reason we can have grids across a large area like Australia or the US 
goes back to a guy called Nathan Cohn, who worked for Leeds and Northrop, I think, and he wrote a famous book in 1950. And, and his vision was that we could have a connected power grid across like the whole of the US. And that came about using um, basic, well, I say basic, um, uh, integral control, you know, various uh, basic control structures. And that's that frequency control system enabled a wide area grid. Then people started objecting to the fact that power stations were in their backyard, so they shifted them out to places like the Hunter Valley and so on. Um, in Australia, we escaped this, but in many countries, because of that separation of generation and load, they got voltage collapses, and some of these collapses were quite spectacular. Then in the 1970s, around about the same time, there was concern with the the overall efficiency of grids, they were kind of too heavy with redundancy. So um, that led to a whole scientific development, um, which I, that's kind of where I came into the story. And then in the 1990s, we kind of threw engineering away a bit and economists and lots of other people came in and we got electric deregulation and market reforms and so on. So where are we now? Well, all of that's chicken feed, really, compared to what's happening now. Um, just forget the top point there. That's, a, that's respecting my previous uh, Bode speaker. In Australia, we now have two major transitions going on, okay? One is, th this is these are from AMO documents. Um, one, this is, shows a kind of orderly retirement of uh, major power plants and you can see the big horizontal arrows are the surprises when major power plants are going to retire well before their anticipated uh, retirement date so this is this is bringing the future forward at a great pace and then this other document or other diagram shows the increasing uptake of rooftop solar as a, and, and the decreasing um, use of coal, for example. And, and look at all this, hydro, hydro is still there, but big batteries and different types of storage, uh, wind farms, solar farms, and rooftop solar. And where rooftop solar goes is still a bit unclear. With 2 million people have rooftop solar, um, what if 6 million people have it? That's, that's not out of the question. So the, the trade-off, the what 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 will be the outcome of these these two transitions in, in my mind is still it's certainly not coordinated. So <laughs> you know where we end up could be a little bit interesting anyway. Um so well just not to labor it too much, but everything is changing. Generation from big plants to in our renewable energy zones, distributed energy resources, inverters everywhere, storage from hydro to hydro and batteries, transmission, distribution, demand. The overall control structure is headed towards away from centralized towards what I call distributed granulated. Markets have to be redesigned. People are no longer passive users, flicking switches. They're now prosumers and they're empowered so I could talk around this slide for the whole hour. Um, empowered here means that they know about things like social license. I mean, do we really want these changes? And if the electricity prices go up too much, we may oppose them, et cetera. So it's a very, very, very complicated situation, which I think is sometimes portrayed in the media too optimistically that it's all just going to work nicely and we'll have green power and cheap prices and it'll all be good. My point is it will only be good if that tradition of science that I've just showed you over 100 years gets in there and with good engineering and we actually solve the problems, but at a much faster pace than we were allowed in the past. And I do think the science is a little bit too low in the pecking order right now for how everything's going on. And I think Kate's talk had quite a lot to say about that in the previous uh, version of this seminar. Okay, power and control. A little tutorial for the non-power people. Power systems control consists of uh, the planning of the grid, 
the balancing of energy, power, and ramping, a little bit like when you're driving your car, there's distance, velocity, speed, and acceleration. All of these things are important. Where the, where the everyday discussion cuts out is that a power system is one big dynamic system and, and it has stability limits and, and unexpected dynamics and we have to deal with stabilizing the grid. We have to deal with controlling the grid. That means regulating frequency, voltages, et cetera. And we have to recover from emergencies. So it took 100 years to work all that out for the legacy grid. And we have to redo it now, largely have to redo it with a whole lot of new dynamics. We can no longer plan the grid and then, you know, planning and, and operations used to be just two separate things. Planning generation, planning transmission used to be separate things. So now it's all kind of mixed up. Um, um, I do have Pirelli tires on my car, but that's just, that came after this. I found this, uh, I really like this little motto of power is nothing without control. <laughs> um, okay. Now, we are faced with possibly the most complicated, it has been said, it's the most complex system made by people. Uh, once again, I guess people would argue about that. But th this is a, a power system is a very good sand pit for almost any mathematical technique you can think of because of the nonlinearity, the large network structure. It's granular. I say now everything from a hairdryer to a one gigawatt um, a solar farm is, is part of the grid because, well, okay, hairdryers maybe not, but pool pumps, yes, they can participate in demand response and can influence the frequency of the grid. So kilowatts to gigawatts is the granularity part of it. Everything now is embedded in the weather system, okay? The generation through, uh, we at home, we turn our air conditioners on, things like that because of the weather. But now the generation end of the system is also embedded in the weather system. So, and I, 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 I thought, Maybe this is an interesting project that there's kind of a loop going on here that the electricity system is embedded in the weather system and the electricity system is influencing the weather system with climate change. So I don't know if there's a project there, but something to think about. And the last thing is that for you people who get into um, um, mixed continuous optimization and so on. You've got all the disasters you could wish for in terms of non-convexity, switch, discrete events, continuous events, and so on. So heaps of machine learning and optimization being thrown at these problems. All right, so what can happen in a power system? This is a slide that I put in uh, a course where people have to get a summary of what can go wrong in a power system. So after a fault, there's all kinds of dynamics that go on. First of all, a power system is a big synchronous system. So where can, and, and it's the, all the rotors of the synchronous machines are spinning at a common frequency. So we, we uh, are concerned with the angle deviations away from that frequency reference. Those angle deviations have an electrical counterpart, which is the phases of the voltages in the grid those phases push the electrical power around in the network. So you've got a very nice, simple connection between the mechanical power going into the machines and the electrical power flowing around in the grid. So that's the synchronism problem. Then there's a frequency issues, uh, just the actual system frequency itself, which the Nathan Cohn's invention fixed. But then there's also oscillations, self-excited oscillations, and then in the voltages, they used to be regarded as pretty pretty uh, stable things, but then in the 70s, they started collapsing short-term, long-term. All kinds of mathematics get thrown at these problems. There's stability theory, um, uh, bifurcation theory. These, these, all these oscillations and collapses are mathematical bifurcations. Um, people have even studied it with chaos theory and so on. So lots of mathematics uh, behind these. Of course, a lot of it just sits in academic papers, but I have seen it inform uh, practical developments, as I'll illustrate a little bit later. 
Okay, the, the, the classical control sits around the generator with a governor primary frequency control in a, in a, in a governor and um, voltage support through a um, exciter. I, I, of course, I don't have time to go into the details, but this is the, the classic basis of or the pillar of control of a power grid. And then that, sorry for my sloppy slide here, but this is being redrawn. Um, frequency control is uh, is now, although they don't always use it, do they, Kate? <laughs> but this is, to me, this is kind of sacred. So I was shocked when I learned that they turned it off. But, um, but you know, this is, for those of you who know about PI control, it's, it's, cl it's classic PI control to regulate the frequency of the different areas and the tie line between the areas. Now, they, in their wisdom, they've decided that it's markets that can regulate the the, um, the what between areas. So that's anyway. Let's let's leave it for the discussion. Um, and you know, a lot of discussion and sort of scientific thinking. I was goes into these things. I was part of. Some of you may have heard of Prabhakunda, who's a kind of legendary figure that's passed away in this area. He convened. Uh, we we had two or three years of meetings over making the definitions and classification of power system stability. And to his credit, he listened to the analyst. We had lots of arguments about what stability means and doesn't mean. And this kind of taxonomy of power system stability became has become pretty standard. Okay. Now, at uh, in Cancun, I'm going to labor these next two slides here. I'll just gloss over them. I want to convince the control community that they have actually been not, not in routine control of power grids, but in special situations, the field of control has played a major role. Um, well, state estimation is the first one. Fred Schwippy at MIT sort of laid down the basic technique for that. I'm going to mention Ian Hiskins a few times. I know Kate knows him. He was my student, but he was a very special student. He's now an endowed chair at Michigan University, but he was a very special student. He had a math degree and he'd worked for industry in 10 year, for 10 years before he became my PhD student. So bingo, I, I struck it lucky. He, and he's just a fantastic guy. He worked for QEGB and he he was fortunate to be in a very innovative group. So he did things like write the state estimator. He, he, he did some Lyapunov-based SVC control. You know, he, they, they, in those days, you could do that kind of stuff. So it was pretty neat. Um, linear state space, lots of applications of that. Nonlinear. I visited a institute in Russia many years ago, and it was like a building like this, basically devoted to applying nonlinear control to keep a power system operating with very little margins. And that, that was the concern in the West. We built these big power systems with 30 40% margins for things going wrong. The Russians were skating along on thin ice using nonlinear control to keep their system up. So lots of applications there. But in the West, my friend Maria Illich, now back at MIT, she she used a feedback line. These are all kind of special purpose controllers for difficult situations. So she did something with the New York ISO with a feedback linearizing controller. She also did something in France. Um, Joe Chow, his singular perturbation techniques are pretty standard in the PowerTech software. So-called Lyapunov techniques, transient energy function techniques were applied in Belgium with Mania Pavela. Cao Dong Chiang uh, has a company based around his algorithms. Um, Stephen Lowe, who visits Melbourne frequently, some of you may know him. Um, he just sent me this that he's got. He's been using his special optimization techniques in the as part of an MPC model predictive control algorithm for EV charging. People in France use model predictive control for zonal congestion management. Uh, Om Malik has a commercial adaptive controller um, marketed by ABB. There's various older algorithms I haven't had a chance to chase up. Prabhakunda himself 
uh, actually used a very, es or his team used a very esoteric, robust control technique. It's a shocking name. It's called H infinity, which nobody knows what it means. But they had a very difficult stabilizer problem. And in the end, they popped uh, H infinity onto it and it worked. Okay, so that's my spiel that, hey, control community, you have been relevant. Not only did you, um, are you responsible for having a wide area grid from 1950, but you've solved all these um, uh, special problems on the way. And there's many things here I could mention. Basically, special protection. I know in the west coast of the US, there's a long transmission from Canada all the way down. And I know they have some special protection devices there based on uh, control theory, but I just couldn't find the details yet. Okay. Well, the next part of my talk is a little self-indulgent. I want to just talk about ooh, the, um, th this theme in my own research, which is structured data and learning. And I call it a control theorist's journey in power systems because that's where I started. When I was running around playing squash with Lindsay over there in Newcastle, I was a control theorist um, proving theorems. So what use would a person like that be in power systems? Goodness knows. Anyway, the story I'm going to tell now is has been recently summarized in a survey paper that was invited by Naomi Leonard at Princeton. And uh, she asked me to write something for the control community on stability and control of power grids. So, of course, I have a nice team. So they... Uh, Tao Lu is a control theorist, Ye Song is a power system analyst, and Li Pang Zhu knows all about deep learning and machine learning and all that. So we tell a story there. Okay, the first problem I ever looked at was a very theoretical one. Um, being a theorist, they gave me a theoretical problem when I became a postdoc at Berkeley. And it's about this synchronism problem. This is good. And this is bad for the phase angles of a power system. Uh, this, this, this means you get a blackout, basically. The systems separate and protection devices close things down and you get a blackout. This it, Power systems are kind of special and it, it is genuinely a synchronism problem. It just matters that all the generators stay together until protection restores order. But as soon as they start separating you've got a problem. Okay, so I, I'm going to give a bit of credit to people that helped me get into this area. I was part of a project in the University of California that was led by Felix Wu and Praveen Varaya. Praveen Varaya is one of the most, I think, the cleverest electrical engineers I ever heard of, and he's tragically passed away um, earlier this year in very sad circumstances. But anyway, and Peter Kokotovich was one of the few people around at that time that had his feet very firmly in control and power. He had an East European background from Serbia, but also studied in Russia, I believe. So he was tremendously, and, and he had a fantastic outlook for young people to help them get ahead. Anyway, this project was an amazing project. It was funded by the D Department of Energy, and it invited computer scientists, control theorists, a whole community because it wasn't this the problems were too big for just you know practical power engineers basically that's that was the decision. And a lot of the leaders in Australia in the world today were actually students and postdocs from that project. Anyway, the problem they gave me sounds a bit esoteric so I won't dwell on it but it it was part of what was called Lee Lyapunov's last stand. There were, as I said, coming out of the Russian community and, and in Europe, in Belgium, in various places, there was all this use of so-called Lyapunov methods or energy function methods. And the energy function is a way of capturing the kinetic energy and the potential energy in the power system and using that to make sure that those phase angles don't go wrong. And but the problem was there was no theoretical basis except for the case of two machines. And also the algorithms were not very accurate. Besides that, everything was just fine, as you say. <laughs> um, so I said, oh, geez, talk about 
and it took me about five minutes to figure out that everything I knew from stability theory um, was not going to help here. And I, I can come back to this later on. It's because power systems are highly coupled and a lot of the stability theory didn't like that. So I read Art uh, uh, Pi's book, M.A. Pi, He's a lovely guy. And uh, okay, it's I got some basics there. And then Art Bergen, who had a system theory background but taught power systems at Berkeley, asked me if I would read the draft of his text, new text. And of course, any of you in the power system area know this book very well, right? Bergen and Vital. In, in its original form, it was just Art Bergen. Um, Anyway, we, we were discussing this problem. And um, in, the, in the middle of this book was a little equation for the load on a grid. And we had this, what do you call it, serendipity moment. Well, what, why don't we just use that equation instead of the one that everyone else uses, which was an impedance model? The classic model took all the generator nodes and all the load nodes, assumed the loads were impedances and collapsed the whole thing down to just a network connecting generators. And that created the theoretical problem. So we just thought, oh, let's, let's just keep all the nodes. And bingo, the answer just fell out like so beautifully, you wouldn't believe it. Um, this was our simple model which was called the structure preserving model. Instead of collapsing the network, you keep the network. So you've got the explicit power flow here and the dynamics. It, this is a very simple form. And we got the first rigorously up and off function in a multi-machine case with non-trivial loads. If you, if you um, assumed the loads were just reactive power, you could get it, but that's of course uh, not very useful. Anyway, just to dwell on that, if you've got this as your, because I'll come back to it later, if you've got this as your network, two generators and two loads, what people were doing before that was saying, oh, the loads are not very interesting, so we'll just collapse it all down. And then they turned a lossless network into a lossy network. And I've talked to people in fundamental mechanics and they go, whoa, that's a really hard problem because it's something to do with the non-integrability. The, the energy function ends up non-integrable. But when we did this, we got a nice answer. But we thought, well, that model's too simple. Nobody can use that model. It assumes the voltages are fixed and it's way too nice. I'm pleased I got a good paper. Um, by the way, the paper, um, I, I don't know if I can say this at CDC, but this guy saved the paper. This paper has like 700 citations now, and it almost got rejected. So for you young guys out there struggling with reviewers, this is unfortunately what can happen. But the existing powerhouses of power systems didn't like our paper because it kind of shattered the, all their, um, their prior ways of looking at things. But this lovely guy apparently was behind the scenes in IEEE and rescued the paper. Anyway, that's part of the history. Now, here's Ian Hiskins, and his PhD was written around, sorry, the, this is all going to get rewritten. Um, his PhD, this is the guy with the mass degree from industry. I tried to get a picture that represented him in those days. Um, he, he said, well, we, we said, look, these, that simple load model with fixed voltages is too um, uh, not good enough. So we... Um, took more realistic load models, okay, so that the power and reactive power are dependent on voltage. And then we got into an absolute storm of theory around um, differential algebraic equations, and then even Marils, who was previously the dean of engineering at Monash Uni, and I wrote theoretical papers around the theory for these equations. Um, and then... Well, lots of other people got involved. The so-called Berkeley School had, we, we had put the nonlinear loads in there, but other people at Berkeley put more details of the generators in there. And the Cao Dong Chiang made the algorithms more accurate. And like I said, he's got a company using these techniques, but there's still a problem. I've been thinking of giving a prize for anyone who can solve this problem on my retirement. 
because we still don't have a complete theory for the case when we have general voltage dependent real power. We can have general voltage dependent reactive power. And there's even a hint in some work by a guy called um, Narasim Hamurthy, who was one of the smartest PhD students I've ever come across, but he just, when he became an academic, he, he just quit because there's too much other nonsense. He just liked to do research. Um, so another story. <laughs> But uh, anyway, it, the, he wrote a very nice paper which suggested that hmm, maybe this structure of the energy functions in terms of kinetic energy and uh, potential energy is not the right way. Anyway, it's an unsolved problem, but probably not a very important one now because of the fact that the dynamics we're talking about is not going to be there any much longer. Okay, step two of my journey as a control theoretician to power systems is follows this amazing event in Sweden in 1983. Um, I mentioned that voltages can collapse. Uh, before these things started happening, people concentrated on phase angles and frequency and voltages, well, they just behaved, right? But then this kind of thing started ha happening in France and, and different countries. A 400 kV grid collapsed. I mean, seriously collapsed and blacked out a, a huge part of the country. And the problem was the power engineering was not a hot topic in then. So they, had, they didn't have people there around who could even uh, contemplate what to do here. So I, um, so my thanks on this slide go to this legendary guy called Carl Johan Borstrom, who... I would have to say operates uh, science for industry at a level unsurpassed. He got the IEEE medal, which is kind of like the Nobel Prize of Electrical Engineering. And um, I, I innocently wrote to him saying, "Oh, I think I'd like to do study leave in Sweden." And he said, "Sure, we've got this. We've got this guest professorship." And um, it was 1986. He didn't care. He he just asked me, oh, do you know anything about power systems? Oh, yeah, yeah, I wrote a couple of papers. He says, good, good. He didn't care that I had no industrial experience, really, to speak of, just some local things in Newcastle. Um, he just thought, well, you can do theory. You can obviously think. Um, come and help us try and solve some of these big problems that they were having in Sweden. And it was fantastic. Th this is where I started talking to industry. So I was going to meetings with Seedcraft, South, South, China, uh, South, China, South uh, Sweden, uh, Vattenfall. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll, I'll have a look at this collapse problem, okay? Um, so I talked to a, a, an engineer who wouldn't know an equation from a cat, but he really understood power, a power system, um, uh, like physical behavior. So I picked his brains and came up with a, 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 a model for the aggregate load behavior that we could actually identify from PMUs and various experiments. So basically the model was if you hit a node in the grid with a voltage step, you've got two things to look at, how far the power drops, which gives you a transient load function, and how far the steady state drops, which gives you the, the, the usual steady state load function. So I put these things together in a nonlinear differential equation. And um, we got, well, I'll, I'll show you on the slide. I'll digress here, but a little bit. The best value book I ever bought in my whole life was this book for two dollars in a berkeley bookshop by a legendary russian scientist called venikov and um so what my load model could do was turn his steady state theory into a complete dynamical stability theory for voltage collapse so we wrote and ian got involved in that uh, too um, but anyway, that's kind of a big story. And once again, you get back to differential algebraic equations where there's the power flow and then the various dynamics hanging off the power flow, in this case, tap changes and load dynamics. And that, uh, as I said, with Ian and others 
led to quite a lot. But just to show the data side of this story, that this is a high, this is a physical model and a database model. The load dynamics, we, we can't physically model the loads. It's, a, it's an aggregate data. People think database methods are new. That's rubbish. We've been using database methods since, since you know, before my time. So this, this kind of hybrid nature of the models with data-based and physical uh, physics, if you like, based, um, led me to just continue on a journey of I've had a separate line of papers on load modeling. <laughs> now, Daniel Carson is now rich. Uh, he started a consulting company and sold it and made a lot of money. But in those days, he was a PhD student in Sweden working with me. And he worked for Seedcraft. And he asked his boss if we could do experiments on the grid to check our load model. And I couldn't believe it. You would never have been able to do this in Australia. But the boss said, yeah, dropping taps on a 400 kV transformer, no worries. Um, so um, we didn't quite get the 400 kV, but we did get up, up the chain a bit. Uh, so we could identify these nonlinear dynamic models. And then since then, I've been working with people in China. And more recently in Hong Kong, we started looking at the demand side when you've got PV and energy. So, so it's just kind of a line of data-based work there. Um, shall I say, yeah, and, okay, right. I'll step, is this step three in my journey is due to another lovely guy, uh, Guanrong Chen, you would never have heard of, but he's an amazing guy. He had no undergraduate education. He was, this was during the, uh, what do they call it? Um, um, the period in China when they closed all the universities, cultural revolution. So he taught himself mathematics at night with a candle after working in the fields all day. He writes poetry. He, he's an amazing guy. He's got about 100,000 citations for all his science work. And I had an office near him in Hong Kong. And so I thought, oh, it seems like a nice guy with a good bunch of students. I go and listen to his talks. And he was looking at the dynamics of networks in a way that I had never thought of before. It was very graph-based, very structure-based. And they had totally different criteria for the stability and synchron synchronicity of grids. So I kind of got fascinated by this. And uh, and they had all, and then I all these concepts of robustness and fragility and vulnerability of grids and scale. And I mean, some of network science is a bit flaky, but but he was grounded in uh, bifurcation analysis and stability analysis and graph theory and so on. So he and I wrote a, a little thought piece on how different power systems people and networks people look at a very similar problem. Um, and then a few years later, we start seeing this kind of thing in nature and, and physics journals, where people took that simple model that I developed with Art Bergen at Berkeley and, and started drawing these huge pictures of what grids look like if you keep our structure-preserving model and if you do the classical thing. And, and these are papers in nature. I'm not thinking, I mean, goodness, it's, uh, <laughs> these are physicists uh, studying power grids. Now, uh, so, and then, um, but I'm thinking, I look at this work, I think eh, it's, it's ignoring the hard bit. I mean, the hard bit starts with the power flow equations. The, the, the power flow, these nonlinear equations, which just describe power flow movement in the grid, are, are a mathematician's nightmare. They, they are really difficult equations. So the idea that we can possibly understand them in their completion is uh, people are still discovering new things in these equations. In particular, voltage collapse was one thing that wasn't even anticipated. Um, so when you start adding all the dynamics, including the new dynamics, we've got a very complicated mathematical system. So the idea that these physicists had 
that you can just look at the graph and say all this stuff seemed a little bit fantastic to me. And, and, and this is one of my favorite examples, which kind of blows that idea away, is that if you take a simple ring network, th this guy was a practical engineer in California, and they started noticing in their power flows, they got different like circulating powers or sometimes not. And he just showed that in a very simple example of the power flow equations in a ring network, you actually had two stable solutions, which was completely unexpected. So that's just, so this, this to me says, this is not just a connectivity thing. This is nonlinear interacting with connectivity, which is far more complicated. So we started a line of work thinking that way. And back comes Felix Wu into my life, who was my supervisor at Berkeley. He had gone to Hong Kong as the chair there. And um, um, he liked the idea that I could succeed him. So I ended up back in Hong Kong. And so we, there was a whole series of papers came out of California, which used that thought piece paper that Ron Chen and I wrote. And this young guy, Florian Dorfler, wrote his PhD with about 30 papers um, all around the network science of power grids. And then one of my students, Song Yu, a very clever young guy, got involved and we did some things around graph theory and, and going back to how grids work as connected layers and the vulnerability of the grid lies in cut sets and, and you know, quite a lot of graph theory was used. So this is very scientific insights into how power grids work. But my favourite result was actually something we did not expect. Because to some, I mean, I like all these papers, but they basically put heavier theory around things that we sort of couldn't solve, but we knew what we wanted. But in this particular case, we didn't know what we wanted. I was working alongside Ron Hoy, and Ron Hoy is an Australian, uh, uh, Hong Kong born, but an Australian citizen, educated in England, uh, came to Australia didn't get funding for the power electronics work he wanted to do, so he went back to Hong Kong. And so he had a power electronics lab right next to my power lab. In my power lab, everyone's on computers. In the power electronics labs, everyone's on bench tops with equipment. And they noticed something very strange. They were studying microgrids, and they started putting smart controllers down feeders and noticed that as the feeder got longer, whatever they did, the system got less stable. And they thought, oh, it's got to be something to do with the tuning of the controllers or whatever. But anyway, we, we got a totally different answer. Um, we went back to our basic graph theory. This is pretty simple. I, I'm not going to go into the detail here, but uh, in this paper, it's called Impact of D Distributed Generation Connection Topology on the Stability of Inverter-Based Microgrids. So if you have a node in the grid where the actual degree of that node, which means a number of things connected to it, over the, um, the total number of nodes in the grid goes to zero, then this important index, which is called the Frobenius norm of the Laplacian of the graph, for those of you who know about those things, goes to zero. And if that goes to zero, your stability is screwed, whatever you do. It, it's whatever controllers you've got. So that kind of proved that whatever they did with their tuning, they were doomed to get an unstable system. When I pointed this out at a, at a workshop in England, people gasped. They said, what? I mean, that's here we are with a distribution grid, which is often based on radial structures. And you mean to say that if we put smart controllers all the way along it, we, we're just gonna run into trouble. So anyway, um, so I'll skip over the next slide. Um, but as it turns out, I was talking to a postdoc about a year later and he'd been on a IEEE task force and he, he saw this result and he looked a little bit cheesed off because he said, well, we saw that problem. We, we saw that. We, we saw that in our task force and we were sure it was to do with the controller tuning, just like Ron Hoy's group had thought. 
And he says, it blew us away when it turns out it's nothing, it's, it's more to do with the actual structure of the grid. So I like the result because it's unexpected. Um, anyway, so that's uh, just goes to show the distribution side of the power grid can be interesting, which is not something we used to think years ago. <laughs> um, okay. Um, how much time have I got? Well, we're still less than an hour, right? Okay. Um, but I, I, I don't just do all theory. We're, we, we, but whatever I do, I like it to be scientific. So this was another project where we wrote a series of papers called it was the CSIRO Future Grid Project. And we had Uni New South Wales, Uni Newcastle, Uni Sydney led it where I was, and Uni Queensland. Queensland did the energy system. New South Wales did the markets. I did the dynamics and control. And Newcastle did the planning, including a gas network. So we wanted to study, well, what will the stability or, or, the, or the frequency control, this is an index of frequency. I think it was mentioned in Kate's talk, Brockhoff, rate of, of frequency collapse. Uh, what is it? Rate of change of frequency, of course. You get used to these acronyms without exploring. Um, so what will, what will this look like as we ramp up the um, non-synchronous uh, power sources? And the number we got for a very crude model of the Australian grid was across many scenarios. You know, you're using simulation, Monte Carlo sampling, blah, blah. And we got up to about 60 something percent and thought, okay, well, it's a bit tentative because the model's not that great and so on. But it, it, it turns out we've seen other work, which is related that, that we, um, when we start getting, people talk about 100% grids, by the time, you know, at some point, we're going to have to change the way we, we do things, okay? Um, we can't just assume that scattering large and small inverters across a grid like Australia is not going to produce dynamic issues. And we're already seeing them, and Beirut is onto it with his arena application, right? So, um, okay, well, I think I better... But we also have some other more esoteric things in terms of deep learning. Li Peng Zhu came from Tsinghua and he was, I had two great postdocs. One was fully steeped in machine learning and the other was fully steeped in um, optimization, but I'm, I'm not mentioning his work here. But this work kind of looks at all the data. We, we, Traditionally, we look at the data coming off a grid, it tends to be node by node. If we want to look at like voltage collapse or stability in a certain area, we look at the data from that area of the network and we look at the data across a time sequence. That's a kind of classic way to look at it. But another way to look at it is to treat all the data coming off the grid as like a movie, timestamp movie, okay? And if you can process that volume of data, it means most likely you don't need to collect so much temporal data. You're trading off between spatial data and temporal data. So that's what we've basically figured out ways to convert transient data into images and then process the images in a faster way to determine across thousands of different contingencies how the grid will behave with lots of different faults. I mean, there's many papers on this, but that, that's another line of pure data-based machine learning type. Now, in the end, I'm not, in the end, why am I saying we might need this? Well, <clears throat> I would have said 10 years ago, no, I, I'm a physical modeler. I want the physical model. But the physical model of the new grid with all the power electronics, you look at the models that people give you for inverters and so on, it's really complicated. So we may be in the same situation that we were in with load models 30 years ago. It's just too complicated. So you've got to use a database technique, maybe. I think th this is where I think, look, I'm happy to just let clever people keep thinking about these things and I hope I see a good answer. But this trade-off between physical structure-based modeling and data-based modeling, I think is a journey that we're still on. Um, 
Okay, well, here's another bright young guy um, who has been working on non-disruptive load side control for frequency regulation. The idea here is, and this is theoretical work, he's a control theorist, um, we operate the power system in two modes, frequency recovery, but when you do frequency recovery, you're disrupting loads, and that might be uncomfortable for people. So you want to get the most out of the uh, frequency recovery mode because that can be quick. And then the AGC will start working. So then you can retire the demand response and, um, and then talk about load recovery. So it's a, it's a kind of classic switched control problem. And he proved that it works in a finite number of steps. So but that, that's a result for the control theorists. Uh, and then we worked on data-based voltage control. Okay, but well, I'd like to say something about future grids. Um, I'm going to have to shorten this talk when I get to Cancun. Um, we're on a journey which people often call towards 100%. I, I had uh, a coffee with Merrin York, who's the Assistant General Manager, is she, of AMO recently? And she was happily talking about towards 100%. And I'm thinking, I, I don't want to sound like, Kate, you get caught as, oh, you're a, you're a naysayer. I'm thinking, okay, I'm just sort of seeing all these strange dynamics and things that we don't fully understand. But you can easily, but there's a lot of optimism out there. And, um, but anyway, but I'm sure she understands the problems, but she's, they have a project inside AEMO on 100%. I'm thinking, okay, I hope, I hope you've got smart people on that. Because we've got these two transitions that I said, decarbonization DERs, and then there's people like this guy around, uh, who I think is a Newcastle boy, Lindsay, he's a uh, Sol Griffith, and he went to the US and he's been advising Joe Biden, and he's got a big website that the answer is to electrify everything. So, so this is what's happening in the end. Um, th th this graph shows load versus wind power. They're not exactly in alignment. And this shows what happens with lots of solar, the so-called duck curve, or some people are now calling it a, a stalk curve or something, another bird anyway. But you're getting negative load. So we've got to figure out ways to have, you know, such, uh, this is where the ramping problem comes in for the poor old coal-fired plants. They can't, can't handle that, that pickup. So we're headed towards 100%, so they say. So here's one image of a future grid. And it's, it's all invert, you know, you've got battery storage, um, PV, wind farms, and, and here's the old legacy turbines down here and all this new stuff connected through lots of, it's basically a power electronic network. It's a future grid with a bit left over of the so-called sync. Now, we'll always have synchronous because there's hydro, right? And especially in Australia, we got snowy too. It's a big hydro. So we're going to have... The range of dynamics here is scary. You've got the traditional turbines and then you've got all this um, power electronic stuff. Basically, you need new types of models for this, the so-called EMT models, electromagnetic versus the traditional um, electromechanical behavior down here. So it's inverters everywhere. And, um, and I think, I'll, I'll skip over that. That's another concession to the control community. So a few years ago, I got asked by the power community to say what I thought were some big questions. It was part of a workshop, and I came up with this eight. Now, I'd probably write a different eight, but I just thought, look, it's, it's on the record. At a plenary session for PowerTech 2019, I said these were major things that people can work on. The first one is the stability of the high converter systems. And, you know, we are working on that. The second one was control architectures and markets of a highly distributed granular kind, DERs, aggregators. And Australia, we haven't, I think we've been too slow with this um, models of aggregation. You know, we've got huge amounts of rooftop PV and if that got aggregated and turned into VPPs, 
Some companies are doing it. I, I saw one company once again mentioning Newcastle, which wants to aggregate PV off commercial rooftops and turn that into a VPP as a business. This is great. That's um, we need more computer science, which is why I'm glad to be here at Monash. There's lots of good computer scientists next door. The data-based control needs to be developed further. And I, I always like, I, I think we should pay attention to good structures like that microgrid theory we came up with just shows that structure matters. So when we're um, enhancing our long stringy grid, which has already had some problems with stability, by long transmission lines out to renewable energy zones, we need to think, is that a good structure for stability? Grid flexibility, the trilemma. Back then I was, I was interested in the energy trilemma, which is uh, low emission, cheap, secure power as a control problem. We, I actually wrote a paper in applied energy using model predictive control which coordinated a carbon market with a electricity market. And it turns out the interaction between the two is not trivial, that if you tune the parameters in the carbon trading market just right, you can enhance the overall performance of the combined markets, but then they can the carbon market. So anyway, um, so all these problems, I think are still grid flexibility is another one. Classic grids are designed, as one old timer famously said to me in a very sexist way, that transmission is the handmaiden of generation. So you build generation and then you build transmission to go with it. Well, now we're building transmission. Well, the plan is to build transmission so we can have renewable energy zones bringing power. It, it, it's understood you can't scatter renewable energy all over the grid and have that work. The point is you need corridors in the grid and it's already well accepted at distribution level that you need to reconfigure the grid in order to get the most reliability. But I think why won't that, 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 that possibly is what should be done at transmission level now too. And all that power electronics can facilitate that. So grid flexibility, as, as Yue Song, my bright young colleague in Hong Kong said, well, David, it's simple. We used to have generation dispatch. Now we can't have that. So we need generation dispatch and load dispatch. And maybe we need grid dispatch. In order to get the whole thing to work properly, we need to think in terms of flexibility uh, of the grid. So that's sort of thinking out there. Um, okay. Um, well, so let's just focus on one of these eight problems. And that's the new stability. I was also part of the update version of the definition and classification terms. <clears throat> and what they did was take the old one and added on these two new ones. Cool. And one of the, okay, resonance stability. Well, let's not worry about that, but converter driven stability. I mean, to me, this was a committee decision, not a scientific decision, because this basically says we don't know what we're talking about. We just know that there's problems due to the converters. <laughs> so we wrap it all up in one box. In actual fact, a lot of this stuff could just, I mean, as the synchronous grid becomes less important, this, I think this, in, in the end, maybe this should be the little box. <laughs> I don't know. But, we're, but it shows we have this difficult scientific situation of where we understand all this stuff in the legacy grid quite well, but we don't understand this stuff very well, okay? And especially how it interacts with all this. Um, so this is one example of a recent oscillation that occurred in Scotland. And the last I heard, they were still trying to figure out what exactly happened. Maybe they've got a report now, but it typically can take months. And there are examples of these strange oscillations, new oscillations appearing in the uh, in the Australian grid. And similar situations have occurred in China and, and uh, Texas, I believe, various parts of the world. So this, this is a whole new world of stability analysis. And then I'll come to Kate's favorite topic. And, and one of mine is this control versus markets. At the moment, 
as was very nicely illustrated in Kate's talk, most of the high level thinking in this area is in the hands of lawyers and economists. And as much as these people are useful, they wouldn't have a clue about the more difficult questions that, you know, that I've been talking about here. Not a clue. I reckon I could trick them with the most elementary power flow question. One, one of my favorite questions to ask a fourth year student is, um, well, you know how you can't pump, um, sorry, water can't flow from low pressure to high pressure. You need a pump to push it up. So how come we can get power off a rooftop into the grid? And they go, oh, right. If that means to a, it doesn't matter what the voltage is. No, all right. I mean, it's, it was the phase angles, right? Phase pushes power, not voltage. <laughs> so you've got people talking about things that they really only have a very elementary understanding of in charge of the whole story. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of scary. So, and I think just go back to Kate's talk and you'll see some beautiful examples. Um, okay, conclusions. <clears throat> we have a, a story with a verging of much greater spatiotemporal complexity, fast and granulated, bringing surprises like these new oscillations. We need to figure out a lot of new modeling, dynamics and control. There's a big question on the relative roles of database versus physical modeling. Can the power electronics people give the power systems people models that capture everything that can be integrated into good model that might happen in which case we don't need to go back to the so much data-based um but we don't have a hundred years to solve these problems the future has happened much sooner and in the middle of it all there are these debates you know people are sort of hanging on to old ideas like that I, I hear economists are talking about inertia markets system strength markets and I saw one consulting report that was just nonsense about what system strength and inertia do. It was, um, and, and inertia's relate, we already have like eight frequency markets. Do, what, do we gonna add inertia markets and system strength markets? And of course, you know, the way economists treat this is that, oh, there's a question. Um, no, there's something we need and they've heard of inertia. Okay, that sounds good. So do we have people out there who'd be willing to sell inertia? And of course, oh, sure, I'll do it. I'll do it. We've got a market. And, uh, but in the meantime, underneath all that is Kirchhoff's laws, mechanic, Newtonian mechanics, all this physics that they know nothing about. And honestly, it's scary. Um, but, but it was better said by Kate in her talk. Um, okay. I think we need a new era of fundamental. I think we need something like that that uh, that DOE program that I was part of 40 years ago. We need fundamental thinking where you get different types of science coming in alongside the economists, not under them. And, um, and yeah, we could have a really good time here in Australia with all that research and showing the world how to do this. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, because uh, the, so there's IEEE, as you know, task forces churning over all the time, discussing what we need. And so I think the pickup for something that people in industry perceive as useful into existing software can be can be quite fast. Um, but I don't know that that answers your question. Uh, if But for a major paradigm shift, like from RMS models to EMT models, I know Merrin tells me that they've got an EMT model of the whole grid. I'm going to meet Mark Gordon sometime soon and see what he thinks. Because uh, you mentioned that he had some concerns. <laughs> so I, I don't quote me on this, but I, I tend to find that senior managers these days tend to be quite like, oh, we got it covered. You know, we've, we, we, it, it's okay. You know, I got a good team. You know, we've hired these bright young people. And then you talk to one or two of these bright young people, some of whom are my students, by the way, and they sort of tell you, well, it's a bit shaky. We, but you know, we've got to keep using what we've got. They use PSCAD and Plexus, basically, I think, for, for the NEM. Um, but maybe you'd like to ask your question another way. Did I answer it? Yes, um, yes, from the point of view of translating it into the tools that people are using it, the, the next question that then would follow on from that, so people may have the tools within the software, the question is whether or not the engineers using the tools are in fact adopting that method. Because I've oh. seen a lot of load modelling just treats it like resistive. It's all resistive, isn't it? Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. That's the worst model. Well, that, I mean, the area is full of that. Ian can tell you a story. His, um, uh, when he first wrote the state estimator, which is, you know, they're, they're ubiquitous now, but in those days it was new. Uh, he wrote the state estimator. And do you know a guy called Ralph Craven, who was his boss, I think, or closely connected. Anyway, they went into the control room one day. Okay, let's see how the state estimator's gone. It was turned off. Um, so, you know, there is a human aspect there with the, with the guys in the control room, and they're all guys in those days. They value their intuition and don't need, see the need for such fancy tools, so they just turned it off. Um, I, so I guess we can take one question from the um, audience, online audience. Uh, so I guess we've got a quite a number of them there. Oh, wow. Oh, boy, we've got a lot of them there. I guess we'll be here until 7 p.m. <laughs> so maybe we can go to the top of the list and start from there. Okay, AMO CEO uh, last year said AMO did not yet know how to manage a 100% renewable grid. Um, AMO's renewable... Um, integration strategy RIS predicts the first 30 minute 100 percent renewable period will be in 2025. How certain do you think AMO will have a solution by 2025? Did he really say that? I I, I guess it's a target for AMO to get to 100 percent 20 uh, by by 2025. But at a given time, not yeah. not across all time. Yeah, I think it was a I think it was instantaneously 100 percent Yeah. I mean so I saw that as a significant step, but certainly well short of what we sometimes call a hundred percent grid. Uh, we're a long way from that. Um, so I, I'd be confident we can manage. They can manage what he said would happen, which is at a given time there'll be a hundred percent because it's already happening in parts of the the grid. So, um, but as for the whole hundred percent story, well, that's not kind of. I mean. Yeah, I, I think that's that's still uh, to be to be worked on. Right. Thank you. So I guess another question from the floor. Kate, a second question for you. Well, <laughs> so what are some of the other? So Maybe there's some another interesting... question online. I guess we've got quite a lot of them there. Um, um, so this one. Thank you for the excellent talk, Doctor Hill. Um, on the topic of uh, grid forming versus grid falling inverters in future power systems with high penetration of inverter-based generation. The current thinking in the industry is that the former will essentially ensure stability. Do you think there is potentially there's potential for differences in the many different types of grid forming algorithms that are proposed? However, 
to produce modes of instability that might not yet have been encountered or studied. In other words, might our own creativity in this regard prove to be our worst enemy? Oh, um, yes. <laughs> it's, I mean, like, just look, take that story on a feeder. I mean, we have different, in, uh, in, like for local household feeders, we have volt, 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 var type modes. There was a paper from the CSIRO, um, Julio, uh, um, there, who's got a control theory background, kind of analyzed how you mix volt watt and volt var just on a feeder and showed you get some, you can have some uncomfortable outcomes. So I'm a, my wife says I'm a pessimist and I say, no, I'm an engineer. Um, <laughs> you know, it's our job to make sure things don't go wrong. So you have to imagine all the things that can go wrong. So yeah, I mean, I'm fully um, a bit, I wouldn't say worried because it creates opportunities for people like us, but I'm, 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 I won't be surprised if we see new things come out of all these interactions. I won't be surprised. Yeah, I, I'd like to follow up on a, on a question from that because this whole question arises out of the arena work on grid forming batteries. And if you contemplate that they were sort of going out saying, well, what should we be doing in this space? What, what's out there? And the question arises in my mind that we've always accepted the different types of synchronous technology, whether it's gas, whether it was hydro, whether it was um, thermal machines. We've figured out how to control it by applying control theory to it and making sure that we could manage it. When it comes to inverter control, we seem to have one type of attitude towards it. It's got to be fast. It's got to be hard. It's got to be you know, bang. in the grid forming algorithms, then it occurs to me that we have different algorithms for different purposes within the grid. So we could have a grid forming algorithm that's for oscillatory stability, or yep. we can have a grid forming virtual synchronous machine. I think we ought to be promoting the fact that there's not going to be one no. type of algorithm that's going to fix this. And yep. a grid is never built on just one type of control method so wouldn't it be better that we actually study them and then make recommendations going forward as to what the best purpose is for some of these absolutely well i mean i'd like to promote monash here a little bit as a newcomer they're they're onto it i think in in ways barriers especially over there um and then we just saw a paper from ian which i haven't studied carefully but he's actually working on putting the best of both grid forming and grid following into the one structure, which is then tunable to different situations. So that kind of answer, makes an attempt to answer your question, I think. Have, I mean, this is a bit deja vu for those of us who are around around power system stabilizer times. When power system stabilizers come along to fix the low frequency, well, no, that, that was initially just to fix local oscillations with the generator on the grid. Then they started, but th this was what optimism can do. Well, if I do something to improve the damping on every generator in the system, it'd be all good, won't it? It didn't work out that way. <laughs> so they needed to either coordinate, they needed to adjust the power system stabilizers to deal with the um, the low frequency oscillate the system oscillations that came about, which didn't fit the bandwidth of the the local controller. So I just see well maybe we'll just go on a similar journey here, adjusting this. And then they talk they had stabilizers with different input signals. I saw in Russia they used to use about five input signals years ago when we only had um, one or two. Um, so, yeah, those developments will go on, I think, to solve these problems. There's one last point that we perhaps need to take into account. The market will adopt whatever technology is commercially available and can be, you know, um, supported. Like, in other words, it, it, they'll adopt the cheaper solution. So the yep. question for the engineering fraternity, I'll call it that, um, is to, in, in fact, call out when we think we've got to have a need for a particular type right. that may be slightly more expensive. Under well, that's where, you know, and I have to accept 
some of that myself. I, I think we've been a little passive. Um, not not you. I think you speak up, but um, but yeah, engineers. Uh, well, I, I come back to the point that the original market was designed with Brian Spaulding on equal terms with economists. That's my understanding. And he had a PhD in power system stability analysis. He, he knew about Lyapunov theory and how grids work. So I'm sure that must have played into the picture somewhere that he actually understood how the how the actual power flows and all that works. So. <clears throat> Yep. Yeah. There are engineers there, but they're managers. And, and maybe that's like universities now. I mean, are, are more managed than when I was young. So that's part of a, an overall development of society, perhaps. And they refer to technical expertise a bit further down the, the chain. But I just think you need that engineering voice up at, at the top as well. Um, or dare I say, a researcher voice. Um, we had an interesting talk here not long ago from, did you see that talk from, was it New York ISO, where the university was very heavily engaged at a high level with the future of their, their you know, their issues, and in particular how the weather in New York influences everything. And um, so I thought that was a very healthy interaction at a, at a high level. Researchers, I, I don't like being told that researchers, oh, you, you can look after the long-term things. I mean, we're interested in, in what's like that voltage collapse. That was an immediate problem. <laughs> you know, the country had blacked out. So there was no point, you know, we wanted a quick solution, but it, but it turned out it was a solution that produced lots of PhDs and lots of papers as well. And that's what happens when you take on fundamental problems. I think they've got a, a short term a, a short term issue, but then it can lead to a a good longer term agenda. Thank you so much, David. I, <clears throat> any questions uh, from the floor before I go to the next online question? Oh, Malin is there. Yes. So Malin um, has a question. Hi, David. Thank you very much for the very insightful presentation. Your description of the Lyapunov function sounds <laughs> like a classical Hamiltonian can replace it. If so, could we invoke the full power of quantum mechanics, including irreversible phase transition phenomena, and build a new theory for power system stability? Uh, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it is a Hamiltonian uh, question. I know that. Um, and I've talked to people who know that subject. And um, I'm just trying to think of the, you know, in, in, in Hamiltonian mechanics, you've got these different forces and, and the forces at play here are analogous to ones in mechanics, which cause a lot of trouble. Because when, it's when you you do the integrate. It's to do with non-integrable systems and mathematicians. I've talked to mathematicians and they still can't solve it. But maybe this offers a uh, another pathway. Yeah, Thank so you, Malin. Maybe, maybe it's a project for you, Malin, to help our system engineers. Uh, any questions from the floor? Okay, so um, Akilesh. Um, Got a question. Thanks for the presentation. I had an opportunity to read the paper you discussed on slide 37. In this paper, which probably we can go back to the slide and see what it was. Uh, in this paper, the limit of presentation purely based on the Rokoff measures, which itself is affected by the parameters such as technical minima of the generators and ramping of the reserves. Yep. Also, the transition of ERE from 35 to 45% still can be accommodated for few dispatch intervals so as per you so as per you which is the best matrix to decide the re penetration limit in the power system can it be taken care in the planning phase maybe we want to go back to slide 37 to see which um unless you know uh which paper it is david already yeah it's a, well yeah it it's the um the one where i showed the um the rock off uh uh, variation with different scenarios. Right. Um, yeah, it's a good question, but it's 
hard to answer. I mean, we, we have to look at metrics, revised metrics for the future grid. One is just reliability. Um, that's something I learned from my discussion with AMO recently, that, you know, they've got these classical reliability measures based on loss of load. Maybe we need other metrics. So I think there's a lot of work to be done on, 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 on how to quantify these problems. Uh, so I don't have an immediate answer to the question, but it's a good question. Thank you, David. A question, any question from the audience in the Bill, Bill up the back. All right, Bill. Hi, David. Um, thanks for that. I've uh, got probably a bit of a left of field question. It sort of came out of thinking about when you were talking, how can we distribute um, renewable energy along the system that we have? And hey, we've only got a few options for putting it in there before everything goes a little bit wrong. Um, is there a good way to sort of meld that with the idea of everybody having rooftop solar and so forth, which sounds like it's a big distributed problem as well. So where, how does this problem work in terms of planning going forward? And is this really going to be something that's a massive, massive problem in assigning where we put renewable generators? Oh, wow. How long have we got? Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, I mentioned the two transitions, which are just happening, like Cannon Brooks is doing his thing, you know, with Sun Cable and sending power to Singapore and taking care of Northern Territory. I mean, to those business, as, as I heard a journalist say recently, Peter Harcher, um, the energy transition was started by households, followed by business and state governments in spite of neglect by the federal government. And now we've got a federal government who's on sort of catching up and none of it's really coordinated. So that's one part of the story. The second part of the story is another journalist who was sitting in the same room. I thought this is one of the best discussions I've ever heard by journalists about the energy subject. It was a young lady and she said, well, the question is, is the science ahead of the transition or is the transition ahead of the science? And I said, really good question. Um, so there's a lot of lack of coordination going on here. And with the federal government playing catch up, they're kind of rewiring the nation agenda. And I mean, who's going to build all that transition without putting electricity prices up? So, you know, they came into power promising electricity prices will go down. But of course, that was maybe a sensible thing to say in steady state. But in the meantime, we've got this massive transient where, I don't know, I mean, one reasonable scenario in the not too distant future is that people can, re can go off grid or maybe with a very small connection to the grid. That could, you know, if batteries, household batteries got cheap enough and you bought an electric vehicle for backup, I'm, I'm a bit indifferent about V2G, but V2H could be a good option to back up at home. Um, so. We just have so many questions. And with all that rooftop power, they're adding an Araring power station capacity each year, roughly, isn't it? Something like that, it just in capacity. So that if that, and it's 2 million homes. So what if it's six? You, you're more or less building two grids. You're building a, a D at what they call distributed energy resources based grid, and we can we can round those up into VPPs and, I don't know, hopefully make a market or something that works around those. Um, and then we've got the decarbonisation of the legacy grid agenda, and they're not coordinated, to my mind, anyway. Comment. People keep referring to planning. There is no planning. <laughs> Let's just get that. There is no planning. There is limited system engineering, right? There is... An ISP, which is done on an optimization basis, but to my yeah, mind, but that's doesn't... not even a plan. That's a strategic. <laughs> it's so that you... people get that. I I just went. I had that problem in my just consulting job now in New South Wales. Somebody was saying to me, "Oh, Amo is the system planner." I says, what? Are you? I mean, they plan the network in Victoria. I think that's that's a limited TNSP role for Amo, but the rest of it. 
is 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 about it's a bit like the head of department doing a strategic plan with a bunch of professors <laughs> they may or may not David, <laughs> comply one, right one of, the things, one of the things that i really would raise to control engineers to understand is the language that's now being used in the ner is deviating further and further from the language that was established by the engineers in chapter four. So the meaning of system security and our understanding of contingency and how it relates to area control and interregional stability is being broken because the market commission has the right to alter that language and they're putting it into legal language, uh -huh. which is less and less understandable well, for engineers to the point where we'll have system security understanding being interpreted by lawyers, not by the oh, engineers. Really so good now, point. We're in grief if we think that we know what's in our theory versus what's actually in the rule. Well, I have a self-interest here because I, I've been studying stability all my life, but the most misused word is stability. I mean, please. <laughs> there's, there's, I mean, they're talking about energy, but they're not even talking about ramping or anything. They're just talking about basic balancing. Oh, the grid's stable. You've got that's like saying an aeroplane at 33,000 feet is is it, it, just because it's at a level that's stable. Well, it, it only needs to be hit by lightning or hit a storm, and it's certainly not stable. I mean, necessarily. So it's the most misused word. I, I I use stability, security, reliability, and resilience as all different things. And I, I think they all get confused. And I was really pleased in our interviews recently to see a DNSP saying their manager was of reliability and resilience separate. Good. Yes. <laughs> Resilience is, you know, emergencies, floods, uh, you know, fires, all that stuff. And the regulators have a problem with that, um, allowing if, if grid companies come to them saying we want to make our grid more resilient, they're only just starting to deal with, um, I believe, with um, how to approve, you know, based on resilience instead of traditional reliability. What's the answer to the question about low voltage rooftop solar? Huh? What's the answer to the question about low voltage rooftop solar to high voltage grids like a water pump? Ah, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fun. Um, now I get it. Yeah, sorry. In if if who who asked this? Edward, are you listening? Yeah. Well, the power flow equations relate real power and reactive power to voltage magnitude and phase, right? So if you look at the power flow equations and linearize them, there's a rough, not fully decoupled, but the most, the biggest connection is between the phase angle and the real power and the voltage magnitude and the reactive power, which is why when we're doing traditional voltage control, we think in terms of capacitors and um, inductors and SVCs and all that stuff. Of course, it's a relationship between reactive power and, and voltage. But it's phase that pushes real power. Thank you, David. I, any questions from the floor? Yep. Hassan? Yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, actually, I have been going through, you know, challenging discussion with AEMO regarding uh, technical issue, PS, uh, or again, it's the market issues uh, inside their systems. So actually in the future power system, uh, everything will be based on market. That's what, that's the future of power system. And uh, now we are going through a transition to award this point, maybe after 20, 30 years from now. But the question, can you imagine or use or see any future, for example, stability market would be defined in addition? Oh, uh, well, I'm not sure. But yes, um, but, but, but it has to respect to physics. It, it, you can't, you know, when, when, you, when you're so stable, like some things are, inertia for me is a parameter. 
Exactly. Actually, it, we it, started seeing this in AEMO. For example, in AEMO now, they consider causer bay approach. So if there is a power plant or GINCO or PISCO causes some issues in the system stability, they need to compensate that later by a market or settle it by a market. But there is no you know, clear definition of stability market. Well, but I mean, for example, they're very basic questions. If you're saying you're going to contribute to inertia, you need to be able to show that so much action that you do produces so much inertia independently of what other people do because if it's all mixed up it's not fair it means somebody out there can be doing all the hard work and then you come along and just add a little bit and you get this big sensitivity and you get all the money meanwhile somebody else even know what i mean you've you, it's got you've got to have a direct cause and effect between the decision you make and so with independent generation at a bus, that's that's kind of easy. You turn a dial, up goes P, and then, you know, then that shows up in, in loads somewhere, right? Exactly. So it, it's still, quite, there's still questions about that because there's no such thing as colored electrons, as they say. Um, so, you you know, all the electrons flood into a nonlinear system. So there are attribution problems, even in the classical market. But when it comes to things like inertia and system strength, it, it, I, I think that gets harder, that at the attribution question. We're going to have attribution questions all over, pardon me, all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> so a stability market, that that could be... Could be okay that, but I would see that more in a capacity sense um, where you make a, a, a certain control action available in the in the case of a certain emergency situation and you get paid for, for being ready to act. Exactly. Actually, the source of this question, the inertia is or was always a physical parameter comes from, you know, rotating part of power turbines, etc. But in the future, the inertia will come, you know, uh, yeah, virtual static thing yeah. on batteries. So it will be, it needs to be a based on actually a market for future power system, maybe after 2030, 2050. And at that point, actually, maybe we need to think more about the stability, new definition of the stability. Actually, there are people who question if we should even worry about inertia. They, I think, Kate, you said it in your talk, Kate, that that I, I know some researchers in the US who just think, look, bring it on. We've got all this fast dynamics. We need to figure out how to control it. Why burden ourselves with um, with that, you know, old paradigm? I mean, I, I'm not going to, that's just what I hear. Yes, Kate? Yeah. Unbundled services, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if we want the price of electricity to remain reasonable and not be gained by every trader who can figure out a new way to play his little bit of control in the you, you need we need to think about what is it where do we put the boundaries of what is actually going on because it will be Yeah, and the problem is it's it 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 gets hard to revert. I mean, they did they did reverse the primary frequency control thing to some extent, but it was, but you know, it's it's like ten steps. I I, I don't want to use the word forward, but ten steps this way, and okay, not quite right. We'll come back, but 
that you're not going to go back to, you, you, to some extent, the egg scrambled, as they say, and, and there's not much you can do about it. Markets are... For sure. For sure. Well, I guess it's a very heated discussion, and I guess we can take it outside then, because I, I was told to, to finish and wrap up the session. <laughs> yes. I've been watching the whole system for 30 years. The big question, actually, is we've done not to predict what is the need. It's like watching the whole system after 20 years. Can you see how the whole system will be? Well, it's a good, it's a good question. I, I keep mentioning this consulting job that I just finished last week. One of the interviews we did was with the AEMC, and the people that were represented by an, an, like the boss and two younger people. And one of the the youngest one, a young lady, we asked we asked all three of them. So what what is your main worry in this subject? So, you know, they might say, like, all the uncertainty or, you know, blah, blah, or can we get rule changes? Anyway, this young lady said, um, I worry about the fact that I'm young and in 20 years' time I have absolutely no idea what I'll be dealing with when I get to middle, mat like, I'm, I'm anticipating I'm going to get to be a, a manager, right? She's a smart young lady and she'll progress. Um, and I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to be dealing with. <laughs> I thought, oh, okay. Well, don't worry about it. You know, I mean, just the, the history of power systems has been roughly yesterday's solution creates tomorrow's problem. And you just keep, you know, solving the problems and, and going on. And I think it's just now, I think the, the rate of change is, is, is higher. So, I'm not going to say what will be in 20 years' time. I actually thought we were just in a CRC, which had a 10-year agenda, and I thought that was a joke. 10 years, like all strictly laid out, everything we'll do for the next 10 years. I mean, that's, to me, that as a researcher, that doesn't make sense. You know, you you, you solve a problem and then see what's next. Um, No, no, I, I, it's a, like I said, people put rooftop on their roof. Business, look at business. Business is based on optimism, right? So anything that's kind of optimistic, they'll, 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 that, that helps fuel the, the change. Um, oh, this... Hydrogen, uh, batteries. Uh, if people get optimistic about something, then there's business opportunities. So that's part of the driver. Well, I guess on this note, we can um, stop this presentation and yeah. heat it Q&A session. And please oh, it's been me. very pleasant, I thought. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, please join us, well, uh, follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Workplace, Facebook, everywhere to, to hear about future uh, seminars uh, of uh, Monash Energy Institute. We've got some refreshments. Hopefully, they're still there. Uh, for for you to enjoy and have another chat uh, and yeah thank you so much for coming okay thank you very much thank you